Good, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Abby, send me your resume because we could use you. Great job. Uh, my prediction, by the way, August, is it August, end of August 2018? I, I'm going to say 2775 on the S&P, which tells you where I'm going because we're pretty bullish about the U.S. economy um, back at Wall Street. And I will tell you, I'm going to tell you right now, um, I did get new glasses recently because every time I give this type of speech, I get an email and says, Joe, you need two glasses, you're too optimistic. So I'm just warning you now. But I can tell you, having been on Wall Street for decades, um, it's fascinating waking up every morning and looking at the commentary and looking at the new news as it scrolls in from North Korea, China, Europe, and of course, Washington. And I, no one's eating, so we're going to talk about Washington and politics. So everyone's done. Um, but it's fascinating what, what's happening down there. But you know, when you look at the Washington, we've got a lot of clients, I'll be honest with you, since 2009, coming out of the Great Recession, unfortunately, we've had a lot of investors just sit on the sideline for whatever reason. You know, it's, it's the Democrats and President Obama, then it became President Trump and Republicans, it came the debt ceiling. There was always an excuse not to be in the market. But subsequent to that Great Recession, we've had an incredible bull run in U.S. equities. And we've had an economic expansion that's one of the longest in economic history. And we don't see any recession on the horizon as we speak here and stand here today. Anyone in this room see a recession in the next 12 months? You want to raise your hand? Or see me afterwards? Because we see a very, you know, not robust, it's not great, but a $19 trillion economy that kind of chugs forward. And we're actually gaining momentum for lots of reasons. You and I are the consumers. We account for 70% of GDP. So if we're feeling better about our jobs, our incomes are increasing a little bit here in real wages, if we're feeling secure about going into the holiday seasons, we're going to continue to spend. And I'll give you an idea of kind of the spending power of the U.S. consumer. Does anyone here know how much we're going to spend on Halloween this year? Halloween, right? It's just one night of fun, or maybe it's a long weekend. Depends on who works for me. Some, some, some of my students, $9 billion is what the U.S. consumer will spend on Halloween. That's up around 8%. That's a lot of candy, it's a lot of costumes. I don't know, it's a lot of whatever. But when I look at the economy from a consumption point of view, it's very powerful. And I think that's going to keep us driving towards that 3% growth. The biggest fly in the ointment, and it's, I'm optimistic, but there's some problems, is that, and I think, I'm sure a lot of companies in this room have this problem, we don't have enough workers for all the jobs, right? If you listen to the media, some parts of the media, they'll say there's no jobs for all these workers that we have. It's just the opposite. We have six million job openings in this country right now. Over 250,000 manufacturing job openings right now. When I go across the country and talk to our CEOs and our clients, the number one concern is finding human capital. And they're paying up. You know, whether it's Target, whether it's construction workers. And I, it kind of really hit home to me earlier this, it was right, right before Christmas. Believe it or not, we've got a client, he's in the construction industry out in Palo Alto, California, Silicon Valley. Now, that's a different universe from a lot of other parts of the economy. But he told me, you know what he's paying a plumber now? A plumber. And we need plumbers. You know, I'm not putting plumbers down, particularly after. He's paying $350,000 for a plumber. And he says, by the way, he's not that good. You know, he, he knows what a wrench is and, you know, he'll show up for work. But, but, you know, there's huge pressure building on our labor force right now because we don't have the workers. Who's going to rebuild Houston and the surrounding area? Who's going to rebuild Puerto Rico and Florida, right? And that's why immigration is hugely important. We'll talk a little bit about that. But if I see kind of an inhibitor or kind of a break to growth, it's that we don't have the workers, which means we lose that output, we lose that demand, we lose that income as we go deeper in 2018 and 19. Now, the good news, we're using more robotics, automation, technology. We're reaching overseas, putting plants there. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. But if I look out there, and it's one thing that worries me about earnings, margins, and growth, it's the lack of workers. But in the meantime, we're in the sweet spot. The U.S. consumer retail sales are going to be very robust this year going into the holiday season, optimism. The unemployment rate's gonna fall below 4%. And by the way, amongst college-educated workers, four-year degree or more, that's considered skilled labor, 
and I, I, I question that. I know some people I graduate with four-year degrees, and I'm not sure how skilled they are, but nevertheless, put that aside. The unemployment rate's 2.5%, which means we're already at full employment when it comes to the skilled labor pool. And so that's kind of where the pressure lies. So we'll see how that plays out. Consumer, good, good shape, going to be a good driver. Capital expenditures, another component of the economy, pretty good shape there as well. We're seeing the energy sector pick up, the construction build out of what happened in Texas, Puerto Rico, and Florida. We're going to see more upside there as well. And we're also building out the energy infrastructure to export more crude and other materials related to energy. Exports doing pretty well as, as right now as, when we come into the kind of the fourth quarter. Trade is contributing to growth. Weaker dollar has contributed to exports. I do worry, however, about protectionism. I'll talk about that. That's very important for this part of the world, right? Around 35% of Kansas' exports go to Mexico or Canada. And then another big share go to China and Japan. So how we deal with our trade partners, how we treat them, and vice versa, is hugely important to everyone in this room. But in general, exports are doing fine. So when you look at the private sector, consumption, investment, trade, it's all positive. And we're going to see that continue into 2018. Then, now we get to Washington, right? The public sector. That's the other. I would say it's a pretty good story there as well. The regulatory touch of Washington has eased up. It's lightened up on energy, financials, a little bit of, say, technology, for instance, but really across the board. And I'll give you an idea of the cost. You know what the regulatory cost is to the private sector or the U.S. economy in general every year? Two trillion dollars. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm the first person that we need regulation. We need the government to oversee clean air, banks, highways. We need an effective government. But when you ladle $2 trillion of extra costs on business, that takes away from output, takes away from hiring and investment. In Washington itself, I mean, it's fascinating. Um, you know, this market really got some juice. The equity market's got the juice. When President Trump reached across the aisle and did a deal with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer on September 6, and since then, the market's confused. Is, is Mr. Trump a Republican? Is he a Democrat? We're not sure what he is in many cases. He's independent, that's for sure. But the markets like the fact that he could reach across the aisle and get this done, keeping the government open, pushing back up the debt ceiling. Will that continue? We'll see. We do expect from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, U.S. Trust, back in New York, that we'll get tax reform perhaps in the first quarter of next year. I don't think it's going to be sweeping, but I do think we're going to be looking at lower corporate tax in general. We're going to bring some of this capital overseas, which is about $2.5 trillion, huge cash hoard sitting overseas. Individual taxes, I'm not sure. We'll see how that plays out. But I do think the signature legislative package from the president and the Republicans before the midterm election is going to be tax reform. And we'll see how it plays out. It's hugely important because corporate taxes, relatively speaking, are the highest in the world amongst the developed economies, and that is a disadvantage for a lot of U.S. companies. And I'll be the first one to tell you, just because companies get a tax break, that doesn't mean they're going to hire more or they're going to invest more. But any company, relatively speaking, after they pay their fair share to the government and local communities and so forth, should be allowed to do what they want to do with their capital whether it's hiring, share buybacks, dividends, and I think that kind of drives the animal spirits. When you look at small cap companies, mid cap, consumer confidence, CEO confidence, off the charts, in anticipation that they're going to be liberated, so to speak, to help do what they want to do, driving growth. And I think that's positive. And that's, that's driving the confidence of the real economy and the markets. Washington also, you know, financially speaking, I get a lot of pushback on this. We are... You know, Uncle Sam has some financial issues to deal with. And I'll give you an example. Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, defense, and interest payments, they take 85 cents on the dollar when it comes to spending. And by the way, defense spending, interest payments, very small percentage of GDP. You could really set them aside. But when you look at entitlements, you know, one trillion plus each, Social Security, so we have to find ways by which we can spend better in a more productive fashion. And I think that's going to be hugely important as we go deeper into the next decade. We do have some fiscal runway. The public sector debt is a percent of GDP. I don't want to bore you with statistics, but it's around 75% of GDP. 
Now, when you get to 90, 95%, you're in trouble. You're just spinning your wheels. You're not going anyplace. And before the crisis, that number used to be at 38%. So we basically almost effectively doubled the level of debt here in this country in the last 10 years because we had to pay out for the unemployment problems, the banks, the automobile companies. But it did work in the sense that the economy continues to expand. As I said earlier, we're, in, we're going to be, we are in one of the longest economic expansions of modern history here in the United States, and we think it's going to eclipse the record if we go into 2019. Also helping the U.S. economy, corporations, many sitting right here in this room today, overseas. It, it's remarkable. I didn't think I'd ever say this. Europe is actually growing. Europe has a pulse. You know, I've been over there so many times, like, would you people just grow, do something? Even, even Greece is expanding. Greece is back in the capital markets. Now, maybe that's a sign that, you know, there, there's too much optimism. But Greece has been through a depression. I don't know if anyone's been over there the last couple of years. It's a depression. It's over. They're now expanding. And we're looking for growth to come out of the European Union, around 2 2.5%. France is doing better. Germany, the Nordic countries, Spain, Italy. Do they have structural issues to deal with? Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. But the European Union matters with or without the United Kingdom. They're the second largest economic entity in the world, right? When you aggregate it, it's almost the size of the U.S. economy, from 17, 18, 19 trillion dollars. And 19 trillion dollars, you put two and a half percent growth on that, you get good output. So that continues to increase. And then the emerging markets, China, growing say six, seven percent, India's expanding. Between India and China, there's almost a billion millennials. Think about that. Right? Here in the United States, we get about 75 millennials. We think they do everything. They think they know everything. That's for sure. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, but nevertheless, they're significant drivers. But when you go to India, right, you see the women. Women, girls are staying longer in schools. They're allowed into the Internet cafe. They can have a smartphone. They're not getting married at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. They're becoming an economic input. They're becoming a consumer. That's very exciting for the backdrop for global growth. When you go to China, they know how to treat women, right? There's, there's more millionaires, billionaires in any place on planet Earth, females, than in China. China may be communist, but they love capitalism, right? That's hugely important. And when, if you look at the millennials in China, 475 million strong, they're driving that economy as well. There's a lot of consumption coming out of China. Now, give me, here's kind of an antidote. Has anyone, anyone here ever heard of Singles Day in China? Singles Day, started by Alibaba, the, the great internet company in China. Singles Day is on November 11th, so 1111. Now, there's, symbolically, China's all about that stuff, right? So 111, it was designed because Singles Day, you're single, you don't have a date, no one wants to hang out with you, so go online and buy something for yourself because no one will buy it for you. So it's kind of like, you know, what more can I say? There's like single branches. I mean, there's the Chinese have phenomenal ways of like depicting things. Well, Singles Day started as kind of like, I don't know, kind of a, almost like a marketing joke or a gig. But last year, Singles Day in China, retail sales over the internet, 24 hours, $18 billion. We don't even come close, Cyber Monday and Black Friday. So I use that statistic to kind of underscore the power of that Chinese consumer, which will be repeated in India and really across the emerging markets. So when you step back, it's a very good backdrop overseas. We're in the midst of a global economic, economic synchronized expansion. First time since the Great Recession, and it's just adding more power to our own economy because we're a big exporter of goods, services, really across the board, aircraft, agriculture, everything in between. So as these companies grow, countries grow, we grow with them. That's what makes me worried about protectionism. You know, if I have one, people say, what keeps you awake at night? Well, lots of things. But one in particular is the United States just turning its back on the rest of the world and deglobalizing, right? Globalization has been hugely important and beneficial for everyone in this room, whether you know it or not. The unfettered flow of goods, people, ideas, data, capital, it makes our lives better. We're more connected. We can reach across the world. We can bring people like Abby to Wichita. That's what globalization's all about. But I'm worried because already a lot of universities are reporting 
that for their incoming class in 2018-19, international foreign applications are going down because they don't feel welcome, there's a sense of hostility towards them coming. And that's gonna be, to me, that's, that, that's the wrong message. The United States is big, it's powerful, it's very large, it's wealthy, but at the end of the day, we still need the rest of the world. We need their resources like Abby, we need their natural resources, we need their markets, and boy, do we need their capital, right? We're a big debtor nation. We run deficits every year. Where do we borrow this money? A lot of times from China, Japan. Those two countries alone own 1.2 trillion, with a T, of our treasuries. Each, each, not, not collectively, each. So when it, we're a big debtor nation and we have to borrow capital day in and day out over, from the overseas markets, we have to be careful about how, the messaging, the signaling we send out. And you know, I think kind of we could, we could work on that. Some of the messaging from Washington has been less than uh, friendly in, in that sense. So in the United States, we've got to kind of step back, kind of do a reality check, and realize that we're big and powerful, but the world's even bigger, even bigger. You know, we're around 25, no, say 22% of world GDP. We're only 4.5% of the world population, which means 95% is outside our borders, and we need these folks. Related to that, NAFTA, we'll see how that plays out, but global supply chains. I was in the logistics business for quite for seven years. I, I find it fascinating in terms of trade, how companies do things. Because remember, at the end of the day, countries don't trade, companies do. Companies are driving goods and services back and forth borders. Now, the, the, the countries have set the rules and they lay out the playing field. And, and I'll give you an example of global supply chains. 66% of what we import from Mexico is really a product being traded between, within the same company. You know, it, it's General Motors Michigan pulling it apart from Mexico General Motors or vice versa, or Canada for that matter. So if we go down this protectionist road where we make it a little more difficult to move goods, people, services, there's gonna be a price to be paid because the global supply chains will start to crack or fray or cost more, and that'll be passed on to you and I. So there's a lot at play. I think you know, President Trump's bark hasn't been as bad as his bike when it comes to protectionism, but I think you know, perhaps we've got more to come. And when I go to China, Japan, and in Europe, and that's what they want to talk about, about the United States being a champion of globalization. We have to be. And, we, and it, you know, believe me, I'm all for America first, right? But it's not a zero-sum game. America first does not have to be a zero-sum game, because if it is, then we're all going to lose in that sense. So to kind of wrap up my comments, we're bullish near term. We think the equity markets go higher. There's some problems out there we got to deal with, you know, geopolitics unequivocally with North Korea. What does he want? How do you pay him off? How do you put him in a box? How does China deal with him? China's finding it very difficult to deal with this North Korean leader. What do we do with President Putin? You know, Putin's a very interesting person. Here's a guy, Russia, they've got nothing, right? I mean, you, the average age of a white male in Russia now, you know, the life expectancy is below 50 years. It's in that age because of alcoholism. The best and brightest have left. It's a one-trick economy, energy. Yet, Putin runs around the world like he owns it. I mean, I love his moxie. But nevertheless, when you go to Central Europe, you go into the Balkans and the Baltics, you hear a lot about what's happening in that part of the world that has to be addressed. The Middle East is, you know, to me, very, it's fascinating what's happening between the Sunnis and the Shiites, how that plays out. Energy prices, by the way, we think are going to stay in that $45 to $55 range. That's kind of the sweet spot. If you get to $55, more production comes on stream. You get to $45, some of these producers kind of roll off as well. And, you know, I think, it, which is fascinating, is, is, and it's emblematic of this great private sector here in the United States, is that we had an energy revolution without Washington. Everyone realize that? We doubled energy production, oil production, in this country between 2005 and 2015 without Washington. That's probably why it happened. But at the state level, good entrepreneurs, risk-taking capital, leveraging the latest technology, horizontal drilling, fracking, we doubled production. And we upended the global energy markets. And I do remember traveling to Norway, Singapore, parts of the Middle East during the revolution, the energy revolution, and the Saudis and the Kuwaitis saying, like, you know, you're, you're marginal, you're not going to change the equation. 
we don't know what you're doing, but we're the big guys that matters. Now they get it. I think OPEC's days are numbered. Maybe it's numbers and years, but the swing producer now is North America. It's folks, a lot of these folks right here in this room today. And it's a great example of while we can be concerned about Washington, the circus, Democrats, Republicans, doesn't matter. Don't forget that we got this fabulous, unrelenting, dynamic private sector that gets up every day, takes risks, drives growth, increases productivity, and on we go. That's a key issue. That's why I want to leave that with you because I still have a lot of people on the couch. They haven't been able to get off the couch with what happened in November, right? Whether it's President Obama, President Trump, I've heard both sides and people say, Joe, it's not gonna, we're, we're doomed. No, we're not. We're not. We're not doomed because there's a lot of folks right here in this room. So at the end of the day, America first, make America great. I'm in here. America's already great. I mean, someone tell that to Washington, please. Help us be greater. When you look at the numbers, just do the facts. We're the largest economic entity on planet Earth, right? No one comes close, relatively speaking, not even China. We're amongst the largest manufacturers in the world. And China's come up, and that's, that's okay, competition. We're one of the largest exporters in the world. We got the number one reserve currency, the dollar. We've got the best universities in the world, and many of them right here, and we were with them today. When it comes to technology, innovation, risk taking, no one comes close to the United States. And that's why the best and the brightest continue to come here. The best military, bar none, on planet Earth. And given the kind of where we are today, that matters tremendously, and it always matters. There's no doubt about that. So when you kind of step back, and you look at our attributes, right? You got, you always, when you measure an economy, it's like, well, what do they have? What do they do? How do they deploy it? Well, you look at manufacturing, exports, our capital markets, the dollar, the military, our universities, our ability to track immigrants and so forth. There's no one on planet Earth as good as the United States. Now, but that doesn't mean we can rest on our laurels. We gotta get up every day and go to work. And hopefully in Washington, they will go to work. Right? Congress doesn't show up very often. It's nice when they're there together. It's like, you know, you and I have to get up and go to work. It'd be nice if they did too once in a while. Or a little bit more than they're doing. Because there's a lot out there, because I do say, effective, good government does matter. But if the long and short of my message for you today is never bet against the U.S. economy. The best in the world, unequivocally. And if you don't believe me, ask the Chinese. I'll, I'll tell you some last story with China. I remember going there in 2010, 2011, the hubris just dripped from a lot of officials I was with, you know, private sector, academic, and government, and they say, you blew it. You guys blew it. It's our turn to run the global economy. You guys are debt, you're broken, you're done. Got that for about two or three years. But during the energy revolution, starting around 15 or 16, as we emerged, became stronger, started putting the pieces in place for future growth, as China slowed down, they had their own problems to deal with, now the shoe is on the other foot. When you go there, they're kind of, China's on its heels, and say like, what did you guys do? How did you do it? And they really respect our technology, our universities, how we do things. Now, I give China credit, they're doing a lot of good things in certain sectors that we gotta be aware of. But to me, when the Chinese just a couple of years ago said we were dead and, dead and done with, now they're back saying, like, we, we really admire you. Why do you think they send us all this capital? They're investing. You know, they, they show their true colors by sending us billions and billions of dollars every year to park in the United States. So whatever, nothing against the media, um, but whether, I'm kidding. Sometimes we're beat in, beaten into negativity and we're not realizing that we live in the greatest country on planet Earth, best economy, best business class universities. You're all right here. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.